You got that romantic firelight, you know, she's she's mm-hmm. sitting over him, mounting him. It's like, yeah, come on. Like, come on. And then, like, the bra, I think, is even, like, unclassed. We're like, yeah. come on. And then- I know. There was a version of this on AMC that I could have watched for free. But I ended up paying three ninety nine <laughs> to get the iTunes version because I wanted the boobies. five minutes. Yeah. $2 show, a tit. Show the titties. Agreed. Remember when we first met John McClane? Argyle picked him up from the plane and took him down the Nakatomi Tower at the Christmas party. And the terrorists were overzealous, but it was sweet when they killed Ellis. And with a little help from Alan, John McClane kicked out. Welcome back to Chat the Movies, the podcast where we answer the question, were the movies we loved when we were growing up really that good? Have you ever caught yourself thinking, why don't they make movies like they used to? Can you still remember spending your Friday night searching for the perfect movie rental at Blockbuster Video? Do you know what Blockbuster Video is? If you answered yes, then this is the podcast for you. I am one of your hosts, Gene Lyons, and alongside me are my co-hosts, Ash, Evil on Two Legs, Schlafly. Hi, y'all. And Big D, Dick Ebert. Good evening. And each week, we take a look back in time and decide if our favorite films still hold up. The movies we cover are chosen by you, the listeners, who generously commission the films you love. If you'd like to see all the movies we have covered or will cover or want to choose one for yourself, please visit ShatTheMovies.com and have a look. At the end of each podcast, we'll provide you, the audience, with the number of wipes each movie would take to get off your respective butts. So thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button and share with a friend. It's how we help the podcast grow. Additionally, please subscribe to our sister podcast, Shat on TV, where we review TV series such as Westworld, Taboo, American Gods, Game of Thrones, True Detective, Watchmen, and Lovecraft Country. You can find all that information and past episodes at ShatOnTV.com. And finally, you can hang out with us live all week long by following and subscribing to our Twitch channel, ShatTheMovies.com slash Twitch, where we play video games, host watch parties, and end each week with a shappy hour cocktail party. All that being said, Big D, what spooky movie are we reviewing today? Uh, Well, we have an annual tradition that every Halloween, we normally will put up a block of movies for our listeners to vote. This year, instead, we came across one of our special listeners who left us a voicemail that touched our heart, Tom C. from Texas. So we decided, you know, in the spirit of giving, since a lot of us aren't going to be giving out candy to kids or, you know, if we do, I'm sure the amount of kids will be less. We decided to give Tom C. a special gift for ourselves, and it was the 1989 Halloween classic, Halloween 4, The Return of Michael Myers. Halloween 4, The Return of Michael Myers is the fourth installment in the Halloween franchise following Michael Myers returning to Haddonfield to kill his niece, Jamie Lloyd. That's debatable. The daughter of Laurie Strode with his former psychiatrist, Dr. Sam Loomis, again pursuing him. As its title suggests, the film marks the return of Michael Myers after his absence in Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. It is a direct sequel to Halloween 2 from 1981, ignoring the events of Season of the Witch. Halloween 4 was originally intended to be a ghost story, but after the poor reception of Halloween 3, due to not being a continuation of Michael's story, the film reintroduced him and he remained the main antagonist of the series ever since. Released in the U.S. on October 21st, 1988, Halloween 4 grossed $17.8 million domestically on a budget of $5 million and received mostly negative reviews from critics. However, the film, much like the series, has developed a strong cult following since its release. A direct sequel, Halloween 5, The Revenge of Michael Myers, was released one year later. So Big D, Ash, all three of us are big fans of slasher flicks. What are your memories of Halloween 4, The Return of Michael Myers? Uh, So growing up, I'd mentioned before that I really loved horror movies, the bad ones. But this was when I was too young to probably even be watching them. I loved the Friday the 13th. I loved the Nightmare on Elm Street. Uh, I used to watch them and talk my mother into driving my friend and I there. But at this point, when we got to 1989, I was 16. I was transitioning out of the horror movies. So I did not see this in the theaters. I did see it probably about a year later. But it was a favorite of mine. And uh, it'll be interesting to see if we think it's still held up. How about you, Ash? Yeah, you know, when it comes to 
Halloween movies, uh, exorcism and slasher movies are by far my favorite. So uh, Michael Myers and I, we, we pretty much go way back. And, you know, I, I think all of us can recognize that there's the, the big three, right? There's Freddy, there's Jason, and there's Michael. And I'm a Freddy girl. If I have to pick one of the three, he's my favorite. But Michael's a pretty close second because, spoiler alert, I think all those movies suck. Um, but mm-hmm. I saw all of the Halloween movies, including this one, sometime in the mid-90s, like, you know, middle school with my friends when they had all already come out, but we were watching them. And I remember in the year 2000 when H2O came out and I was super excited because I loved the Halloween movies in the mid nineties. And so I think I'm in the minority that that's one of my favorites, but this one and H2O and of course the first one are some of my very favorite Halloween horror films. So I was pretty excited about this one. Yeah, Shat the Movies has introduced me to so many things that I just missed in my childhood. And so, of course, we did the Indiana Jones series, and I'd never seen any of those before. Uh, Until we did the original Halloween for Shat the Movies, I'd never seen any of these movies. And I was surprised when I went back and looked at my Shat score was four wipes for the original Halloween. But I somehow got hooked on the series at the same time. So in 2018, when that Halloween came out and Jamie Lee Curtis was back, I went and saw that one at the drive-in. And that one also pretends that the events after Halloween 2 never happened. I think everyone just wants to forget Halloween 3. But, you know, I'm a late bloomer when it comes to the franchise, but I loved the 2018 Halloween. And I think I've loved every single one I've seen since the original. So I am now a, a believer in this franchise and I get it. And it's just different enough from Jason and from Freddy to have its own like special spice. And I, I get it now. It took me a while, but I'm, I'm finally on board. You see, and I disagree with that. I think that Halloween 3, on its own, if you took it out of this franchise and just called it Season of the Witch, it's a screwed up enough story. And it's twisted enough that it would be entertaining. It would be a cult classic on its own. But that misstep caused the rest of the franchise to be uneven. It was all over the place. Whereas the other ones kind of had a slow, gradual decline to like Jason in space and then Freddy and Jason (laughs) fighting in hell. Uh, This one has been all over the place. But today in 2020 and next year with Halloween Kills, this has been the one that has stood the uh, test of time. So glad we're reviewing it today. Yeah, and I can't imagine how pissed off Carpenter was when it's like, okay, so we're going to do this anthology of films. It's always going to happen on Halloween, but it's going to be like different shit every year. And the American audience is like, oh, I don't get it. Where's no. Michael Myers? <laughs> That's yeah. what we want. <laughs> All right, Big D, let's get to the trailer. Same. Now, Michael Myers has come home. He has returned for one more night of unholy terror. Michael! He's here to kill that little girl and anybody who gets in his way. Oh, God! Who's gonna be next? Halloween 4, the return of Michael Myers. Maybe nobody knows how to stop him. Well, on October 30th, 1988, Michael Myers, who has been in a comatose state for 10 years since the explosion at Haddonfield Memorial Hospital, is transferred to Smith's Grove Sanitarium by ambulance. Upon hearing that he has a niece, Michael awakens kills the ambulance personnel, and makes his way to Haddonfield. Michael's former psychiatrist, Samuel Loomis, learns of Michael's escape and follows Michael to a gas station where Myers has killed a mechanic and a clerk. Michael escapes in a tow truck and causes an explosion, destroying Loomis's car in the process. Loomis is then forced to catch a ride to Haddonfield. So it's been, admittedly, years since I have seen any of these except for Halloween, which we covered for the podcast. So it opens up, and I had to orientate myself. I'm like, okay, why is Michael in like a hospital bed? He's all wrapped in bandages like a mummy. His mouth's covered. His eye's covered. They're taking his vitals like he's you know on the edge of death's doorstep. And then I realized, I'm like, no, wait wait a minute. This is 10 years since the explosion at the hospital, right? I'm like, why is he still bandaged up? Does he eat? 
Does he <laughs> bathe? What's he What's he been doing for 10 years? Is he just resting? Yeah, I know that at some point when they were writing this movie, they're like, okay, so it's like a year after, and then Michael's going to go after Jamie, which is his last surviving relative. And they're like, wait, wait, so Jamie's a year old? And they're like, oh, shit, okay, so it's 10 years later. Yeah. And then they just rolled with it. <laughs> but, you know, he is a supernatural entity, I think is what we're meant to believe. So uh, maybe he just like heals at a different rate. I don't know. It's for suspense. No, I forget all of that, guys. I mean, how the fuck is the dude walking when he comes out of his coma? Because if this were realistic at all, like his muscles would be mush. He'd be dragging himself by his like very like deteriorated arms back and forth trying to kill these people. It would have been absolutely ridiculous. And that was the part I was going, what? Like, how is he even how is he even up and about? Now, this is a dumb gene thing to say, but like, for me, the rule is like, as long as the movie makes an attempt to address it, I'm, I'm cool with it. So yeah, they were like, he can't be walking around. It's been 10 years and he, he's been in a coma. His muscles <laughs> would be mush. And everyone's like, yeah, OK, but he is. You know, and I think that's why you're making the case for why nobody thought he was a threat and why they didn't take like great security precautions, because all of science says this guy can't be walking around. No. And I totally think he was working out on the down low. When they would like lock him in his room at night, he was pulling like a Sarah Connor from Terminator doing pull ups with the bed frame. And also he's fueled by hate. That hate just kept him energized. Mm -hmm. He was ready to go. Right. And I will give this movie a pass. The script was written in 11 days. In 1988, there was the Screenwriters Guild. There was a strike that lasted 155 days. They were up against the window and they said, hey, we want you to write this, but you got 11 days. To write this script in 11 days, I am going to cut it some serious slack. And like you said, Gene, as long as you address it in the movie, how ridiculous things are, I got to be okay with it. And there's a purpose in being in a coma, right? Because the joy of slasher flicks is like teasing us with that violence, right? You're like, okay, when's he going to kill somebody? All right, when's he going to kill somebody? All right, when's somebody going to die? And you're waiting, you're waiting, waiting. And in this case, that tension that was building up was just how casual everyone was being about handling Michael Myers like you like we know because we saw him kill we're like oh that's a big mistake like what are you doing but you know but in this case you're just watching and screaming at the screen in the first five minutes like everybody watch out and uh, I love that they walked us through the facility and the chain of custody and how everybody's just treating it like it's a normal ass night but clearly there's like a storm like all the things that tell you something's gonna go very wrong here it worked for me yeah, and people should be cautious around Michael. He has enough of a history in this town and in this asylum. But they think normally, as long as we keep a kitchen knife away from Michael, we know he's pretty much not going to be able to do anything. But holy shit, his first kill, we get to see his new deadliest weapon is his hands and particularly his thumbs. They are effective. In that ambulance, he grabs the EMT and shoves his thumb through the forehead, through the skull. I was like, oh, I didn't expect that. Later on, he does the same thing to Brady's cheek. It is surprisingly brutal. It's in your face. And then later on, on the open road, he rips Earl's head open. He rips it from like under the chin. It is surprisingly brutal and very effective, very frightening. See, but I, I, I think this is why Freddy, though, is like my favorite compared to this, because I think what's more frightening with like a true slasher film is when it's somebody like that, you know, right? Like some, like the strangers, for example, is like such a fucking terrifying movie because they're just normal people. And if you shoot them, they die like Michael Myers throughout the different iterations of him. He becomes more and more supernatural. Like you said, Gene, like he starts by being somebody that gets shot and walks away to being somebody that can shove his entire fist through some someone's face and bone and it not make a difference. And for me, that's when Halloween becomes more fun than scary because I don't find that ridiculousness scary. Like you knew the second you saw those guys, you know, with the clipboard, you're like, oh, well, they're going to be the first to die. Like, I mean, you know, the setup, you know, what's going to happen. And and I do think that that's kind of the ridiculousness as these movies went on is that it isn't quite as scary when the stakes are so unbalanced that, you know, the guy is basically God. Well, for me, what really sets Halloween apart is that it's so ridiculous and Michael Myers could pretty much do whatever he want. But at the same time, it treats itself so seriously. Like Dr. Loomis is such a serious character. And like, you know, when, when they're going from one scene to another, it's like 
it actually like puts on screen like October 31st, Haddonfield, Illinois. Like like we're gathering <laughs> clues here. Like there's some mystery we're going to solve together. Th- this isn't a, an intellectual thriller. It's a fucking slasher flick. And I love that it keeps itself so buttoned up that that spirit that was started for Halloween in the 70s has carried through in the 80s. Uh, where it's it's going to be ridiculous. Michael Myers is going to do things that are completely far fetched, but it somehow is keeping a very straight face when it's delivering these jokes. Well, and nothing is more serious than Doctor Loomis, and it's so nice to see him. Like when he walks on screen, it just sets this entirely different tone for the movie. Um, now, supposedly, and I did not know this, but supposedly there's a lost scene somewhere to explain how Loomis survives the mm-hmm. hospital blowing up. That, like in this lost scene, like it blows up and he just gets like ah, like blown out of a door, which I think would have been amazing <laughs> to watch. Um, and he has this great line where he screams, "Let him burn!" about Michael, and then they pull you know his body out i think that i think that really in a director's cut somewhere i'm hoping we get that someday but i do absolutely love him and every scene that he's in is so serious you have to kind of giggle a little bit but respect it and he's just he's incredible yeah donald pleasance he's like the james lipton of horror movies like when he like he shows up and he's trying to put on an acting clinic you know while everyone else is just like yeah, uh, so what, when I get stabbed in the titty here, is that what happens? You're going to tear my head off? And he's like, you know, he's in there, yeah, let him burn. You know, I think he's really committed to it and he makes it so special. And I think we knew from the original Halloween that like this guy is what makes the series. Like Michael Myers is okay, but really Loomis is where it's at. Well, Jamie Lloyd, Laurie Strode's daughter and Michael's niece is living in Haddonfield with her foster family. Although Jamie knows about Michael, she does not realize he is the man she has nightmares about. On Halloween night, Jamie's foster sister, Rachel, cancels a date with her boyfriend, Brady, to babysit Jamie. After school, Rachel takes Jamie to buy ice cream and a Halloween costume. Michael arrives in Haddonfield and steals a mask from the same store where Jamie and Rachel happen to be. So I love the fact that in these stories that Michael's an urban legend of sorts that like people don't believe like he actually exists. I do think that that's the one thing that remains that makes these movies so scary. Uh, I think some of the best parts actually work when they're like, what? Like, he's not real. Like Brady, for example, he's like, what the fuck? Like, you know, it's like talking about the boogeyman. And if you think about it, why would he really exist if he's this supernatural being? So he is the perfect boogeyman because he's this legend. And so you're afraid of the legend when you're a kid, but he's also real and he's going to kill you. So you have to be afraid of it when you're an adult too. And that at least remains and is scary throughout them. And in this one as well. See, but I have a hard time believing that because later on, you know, the hillbilly truck lynch mob, you know, the dudes with the big bellies and the shotguns, one of them, the son was killed by it. The townspeople know the horror that happened 10 years ago. And and that made me wonder, why are they selling these masks in Haddonfield? Wouldn't this trigger some bad memories for people? I I mean, I don't know, but people out there tell me, do they sell like trench coat mafia Halloween costumes in Columbine, Colorado? You mean trench coats? No, I mean, is that the costume? You just wear a trench coat? No. Yeah, they sell those in Columbine. I'm saying if they had a full kit, like a school shooter kit, do they sell a school shooter kit out there? Or do people think that's a bad idea? Or they have like Hitler masks in Israel? Yeah, we still sell school shooter kits. It's called the Second Amendment, Big D. Oh, my. It's called an AR-15. (laughs) There's another one, Star. Well, and I mean, I think that if you slow it down, when Loomis is in the elementary school, two of the classroom windows have like a Michael Myers like decoration on their door. Like, I think that he's meant to be like, was it really him? Is he dead? Mm. Like, it's one of those things that we, I mean, guys, we're, we're telling people that coronavirus isn't real and it's still killing people. Like, I mean, it's not beyond, you know, it's not beyond like human nature to believe that things don't exist. And like the movie Scream, it parodies this beautifully because look at Scream 2 all these people are walking around in the same like horror masks because they're parodying what what happened you know just a few years before i think that it's something people do dress up like these people and maybe in bad taste but people do it okay then if i can make a suggestion i'm gonna have a little rewrite a little improvement for the movie let's cut out where michael goes into the store to get the masks to terrorize little jamie and instead we get the scene where all the michaels the local kids are dressing up as michael myers to prank the police i think it would have been so much better if at that moment when the police pull away one of the kids gets killed by michael who's still in the bandages he takes the mask back 
lot like what they did in Friday the 13th Part 3. Jason never wore the hockey mask. The hockey mask was a prank by one of the kids trying to scare one of the other counselors. So I don't know why they didn't use that here. I think it would have been a much better way to reintroduce the mask to the character. Probably because Friday the 13th Part 3 came out in 82, and they're like, well, shit, now we can't do that. Oh, I think you could. <laughs> We'd just be copying Friday the 13th Part 3. Oh, they got no problem copying other things. My big question is, like, does every kid in Haddonfield have, like, two or three jobs? Like, they're, this is the most overemployed teen workforce I've ever seen in my life. Kelly and Brady are at the general store. Rachel's a babysitter. Lindsay apparently is, like, the 1988 version of Uber. And I've got two theories on why this is going on. One is that, like, there's so many killings in Haddonfield that the workforce is just really lean. Like, these are the only kids left alive. Or teens are just fleeing the city as soon as possible. Like, as soon as they're old enough to have a car, they're like, I'm getting the fuck out of Haddonfield. Bad news here. I mean, well, we see that the Carruthers family, the husband, on Halloween night, he's going to leave to go to a work event to hopefully get a promotion, right? So work is important. He's willing to put the mental health of his foster child clearly secondary because Jamie should not be spending Halloween night in Haddonfield. She's obviously a traumatized child. She has to have some therapy and some support. She's tormented at school. Those damn kids, boogeyman, boogeyman. She's having night terrors. You know, why would her foster parents leave her home at Halloween? Why wouldn't you take her on vacation? Take her anywhere. And then Rachel's like, hey, Jamie, do you want to go out and get a mask and get some candy? It'll be scary. No, Rachel, Jamie's mother died. Her brother tried to kill her. No, she does not want to go get ice cream. Dude, you're such a 2020 parent, though. In the <laughs> 80s, our parents didn't give a shit. Don't you remember? I mean, my, my mom would just be like, well, I'm going to go out dancing with my friends. Like, have a time. You know, it was it was it, p- parents wanted to go party and get their fuck on. And they were like, kids, you'll be fine. Like, and, and honestly, I believe this is healthy for relationships. I think that I think that parents do better when they like focus on each other, not so much about the kids. And now we're just kid obsessed. And, and that's not a that's not a knock on either of you. I mean, do your parenting however you want. But I think I'm going to be, you know, if, if I were to be a parent, I would be a very hands off parent. Just be like, yeah, cool. I mean, you're going to survive. You're going to be OK. Yeah, you say that. And so you get all these other people who put all those pressures on you and, you know, send letters home if you're doing things incorrectly and the whole Pinterest mom, like, it's just not possible to be a parent like that anymore. And I I thought I would be the same thing. I thought I would be partying and getting my fuck on and I'm not, I'm, you know, Googling how to cut sandwiches out in dinosaur shapes and, you know, put fruit that's shaped like flowers next to them so that I don't look like a bad mom at lunchtime. You know, one night, uh, Carrie and I were out at like this goth club and a lady came in with, uh, what do you call the basket thing that you carry a baby in? Baby carrier. It's got a handle, a baby carrier. Here's the baby carrier. It's fucking English, right? In German, you know, there's a fucking term for it. But, you you know, this lady came in and she just set the baby on the bar and just like ordered a drink. And I was like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, I'm not that guy. I'm not bringing the baby to the bar. But what I'm saying is that, you know, like my mom, like, like, do you guys remember breakfast? in the in the 80s like you see rachel in in halloween four and she's she's on a diet so she's eating a bagel like like that's nutrition (laughs) in the 80s right no sorry mom i'm gonna eat this bagel i'm gonna keep it healthy when when i was a kid breakfast was fucking cookie crisp or captain Mm -hmm. crunch or like just a tortilla rolled with cream cheese inside of it or a pop tart it was just what my mom didn't wake up to make me breakfast you just feed your fucking self is that like, do kids still eat that shit or is it now like, do you give them like a perfectly balanced breakfast? Oh, no, man. We are a Pop-Tart oh, no, and cereal household. No, no. no. That, that, I think that's all a great idea. And everybody starts out with that. Oh, we, we do everything organic. And yeah, it's going to be completely natural. And then today she's like, hey, I want some uh, cinnamon toast crunch. What did Emma grow- wake up drunk? <laughs> no, what do you mean? Hey, I want hey. some cinnamon toast crunch, Dad. <laughs> Give it some crunch, man. In, in the morning, they're a bit tired. They can be a bit groggy, and they're not that coherent. <laughs> yeah. So she stumbles to the to the freezer and gets what's like an ego waffle, but it's cinnamon toast crunch. Yes, I feel a little bit guilty giving it to her, but it's also uh, at some point you just got to say, pick your battles. I mean, the three remnants that that I have from the 80s are Pop-Tart, cereal, and um, Lunchables. I believe very much in all three, especially on the weekend. I will say we are only a Cheerios household. The sugar cereals don't exist in our house, but that's just because, you know, I'm cheap. I don't want to pay for dental care. So, Like normal Cheerios or Honey Nut? Just normal. 
monster. No, and we cut up Hall- like, you know, Halloween bananas five or is things. Ashley's cereal selection. What the fuck, man? Mm-hmm. Honey Nut is so good. I know, but it's got so much sugar in it, and I don't want it's their honey things to rot. And nuts. It's okay. It's sugar. We have Cheerios with bananas. And, and listen, guys, I want to clarify. I'm not. I'm not saying you should give kids a healthy meal. Like I've, I've said this before, I think on the pod, where my only regret from my youth is not eating shittier food because you could get away with it. It was like your body was fucking immune to that shit. You could have like Mountain Dew and Chicken McNuggets for every meal, and you're fine. You're totally fine. No weight gain, like no diabetes happening. You're just a fucking happy kid eating whatever the fuck you want. I say go for it. Well, that night, as Rachel takes Jamie trick or treating, yeah. Michael goes to the electrical substation uh-huh. and kills a worker by throwing him into high voltage, plunging the town into darkness. Meanwhile, Loomis arrives in Haddonfield and warns the new sheriff, Ben Meeker, that Michael has returned. Michael attacks the police station and kills all the deputies. A lynch mob is formed by the town's men to kill Michael, and Rachel discovers Brady cheating on her with her friend and Meeker's daughter, Kelly. Then she loses track of Jamie. After being chased by Michael, <laughs> Rachel finds Jamie. Uh, so like you said, Gene, I think Loomis's character is the linchpin that holds us all together. He's very serious. There's no levity in any of his, of his delivery. He comes into the police station. He is ranting like a lunatic. And I'm like, I'm like, Loomis, calm down. There's no way anyone is going to listen to you. But to my surprise, Sheriff Meeks immediately listens. Everybody in the town takes it serious. They're broadcasting on TV. Stay inside. Lock your doors. Parents are out there like in a minute picking up their kids or getting them off the street. You have the good old boys who mount up and create that pickup truck lynch mob. This is a good idea. And it's happening. People are proactive. In most movies, when somebody says, oh, I saw somebody down by the river, nobody takes them seriously. And here the town is doing what it needs. And it was a pleasant surprise. I groaned out loud when Loomis went into the the station and was talking to Meeker. And I'm like, oh, no, I know where this is going. He's going to say, you know, call and check. And he's going to be like, we're not going to call and check anything crazy. Old man. Maybe lock Loomis up like, you know, that, that's uh-huh. something that would typically happen yeah. in a Nightmare on Elm Street movie. Instead, I was pleasantly surprised that they're like, yeah, OK, that that sounds reasonable. Actually, we'll check it out. Shit. The phone line's dead, where, again, other movies would be like, phone line's dead. I guess you're lying. They're like, phone line's dead. Something's up here. We should probably get on it. (laughs) The problem I had was a bunch of honkies with shotguns, rifles, and pickups are not my idea of a good time. They're not my the people I want to hang out with, but they are probably the least likely people to just point at a bunch of bushes and fire their guns. Like, let's be let's be fair here. Like, you can say what you will about the good old boys, but they generally take their firearms pretty seriously. They love protocol. You know, I've been chastised so many times while out shooting by, you know, some old guy that's like, oh, son, you know, you, you got to identify what's behind your target before you pull the trigger. Yes. You cannot post a picture of anybody shooting a gun on Facebook without a hundred of these dudes being like, fingers in the trigger guard while you haven't acquired your target. You know, they, they know what they're doing. This is bullshit. They wouldn't just shoot the guy in the bushes. No, they would have gotten Michael within like 25 minutes. There's yeah, no doubt. Easy. They would have killed Michael. They would have holstered their weapons. They would have cleaned them and been back in the bar drinking <laughs> within like 35 minutes. There's no. They were the true hero of the movie. And the way that they were portrayed was just awful. It was terrible. But the 80s and the 90s, there was such a different time. I mean, here we see the kids. They're out running in the street. They're playing. They're having fun. The parents come out when you need to at the end. And and that was the experience I had when I was young. We could in our neighborhood is a big group of kids would go out and trick or treat. It's sad that that has changed, but I understand why. But the bigger problem I have is that Jamie, she's lived in this town for 10 years. She's trick or treating in her neighborhood. How does she get so lost? And how the hell does she get so lost that Rachel, who's lived there for 18 years, can't find her? I don't know. I guess this is like an age thing because I was born in 83. So like the the time frame when this would have been for me is like late 80s, early 90s. But like my parents by that point would never let us go along. None of my friends' parents let us go alone to, to trick or treat. I think that, you know, by this point you had, you know, the razor blades and candy. You had your poison apples in New Orleans. Satanic panic was already a big thing. And in New Orleans, you know, everybody's satanic if, you know, they're celebrating Halloween in certain sectors of the 
the city. So uh, I could not relate to that at all. And I have to tell you, at 10 years old, if you would let me loose, I would have been so fucking lost that nobody would have ever found me. So I kind of sympathize with Jamie a little bit. But you can't get lost in a gated community. How are you going to get out? I didn't grow up in a gated community. Oh, oh okay. I grew up next to a park that I would have gotten fucking lost in. Yeah, you know, any of us who have played Dead by Daylight, uh, which the Shad community are big fans of, you know, you know that the best place to run or sneak, I guess, if a killer is chasing you, is into the darkest, most fucked up part of the map possible, <laughs> you know, in the game. But, but in real life, yeah, the best place to run if you're walking down a street. And you see a killer at the end of the street. The best place to run is the way that you came from. Just turn around and go back the way you know is clear because you just walked through it. No. What does she do? She takes a left and she's like, I'm in a junkyard. There's like a chain link fence. And then what does she do? She doesn't turn around from the fence. No, I got to go over the fence. <laughs> but this is what makes slasher films so great. It's if you're not screaming no at least 20 times at the screen during a movie, they fucked up. Well, yeah, and they all have to have one of these like insanely dramatic deaths. And the Halloween franchise always gives us one just amazing, memorable death each and every movie. And for me, this one is when Michael shows his superhuman strength and he picks up the guy at the electrical station and he hurls him like a football into that electrical wiring and everything goes off. Everything explodes. It looks like fireworks on New Year's Eve. I think that it is so funny, but also really amazing because I think it's just fun. And I, I talked a little bit about like Freddy Krueger and I understand that he's supernatural too, but he, he fucks with you in your dreams. And like, that's really fucking scary. Like this guy, this big lumbering dude coming at you, like I could avoid him picking me up and throwing me in an electrical substation. Like I would just run away from him. And so it's just fun to watch that. And it's a perfect example of why these movies are so much fun to watch, especially like a big group on Halloween night when you've had a couple of drinks, cause they make no sense, but they're just, amazing to watch you know, ash you said that the uh power station death looked like a, a fireworks show i was like this looks like a motley crew music video like i like it looked like a stage setup like psh, slow motion sparks everywhere and and you're absolutely right the great thing about michael myers is like he can be as fast as he wants he can also be quiet when he wants like there's no <laughs> rules here he just does whatever the fuck he wants he is in a car with a deputy at one point and like the guy doesn't notice michael myers back there um uh, or he's on one side of the street suddenly he's like you know he could run over and be in your house at the same time like i love that about him that all the rules that we get with every other killer we they're they're just gone with michael myers he does whatever the fuck he wants uh, well, I think we need to give some some respect where it's due. Uh, the electrical substation worker, his name is Bucky. <laughs> he has become like an internet. If you ever search Bucky Halloween 4, right. he is a legendary character. He comes out there and he's like, hey, hey, uh, what, who, who are you over there? You you just get away from there. I'm going to go call the police. And he turns around. You can see he's kind of nervous. I go, shit, is this guy going to follow me? And then Michael starts like shuffling his feet. It takes two seconds for him to close that distance. And Michael, besides the super powered strength, he is stealth and he has just a real sense of, of timing. He knows how to. I think he was trying to finally kill someone out of fright that he would come up, not even touch them, and the people would just die. Well, Sheriff Meeker and Loomis arrive and take the girls to the sheriff's house with Brady, Kelly, and a deputy. They barricade the house, and Loomis goes looking for Michael. With Sheriff Meeker in the basement awaiting the arrival of the state police, Michael sneaks in and kills the deputy and Kelly. Discovering the bodies, Rachel, Jamie, and Brady realize they are trapped in the house. Rachel and Jamie flee to the attic when Michael appears, but Brady stays to fend him off and is killed. The girls climb through a window onto the roof, and Jamie is lowered down safely, but Michael attacks Rachel and knocks her off the roof. So we've talked about things that every slasher movie needs. And for me, even as a heterosexual woman, I always enjoy and look for and anticipate that moment when some big breasted blonde girl is going to mm. show her tits on screen and then get stabbed, right? Mm. Like that's a part that we're all waiting for. And so, you know, I didn't remember a lot of this movie. And so here's Kelly and she takes off her shirt. And she's even got like that consummate, like virginal white bra, you know, that every teenager in a slasher movie has. And I'm going, okay, this is it. And then 
we are totally denied this part of the movie. She just Bullshit. like collapses onto Brady and she has huge boobs. Like, you know that she walked into a casting room and people were like, yep, like she's it, right? Like she was built to play a girl in a slasher movie that shows her tits and gets killed. And I was really shocked and really disappointed, you guys. Mm-hmm. I talked about this on Fast Times at Richmond High that with all the porn we have today, it just doesn't have the magic of like 80s movie boobs. Like there was just something very, very special about them. And I had to go back and, and listen to our original recording of, of Halloween uh, for Shat the Movies because in that I did some boob research. Uh, Judith Myers, I was like, whose titties are these? You know, and I looked it up and those were shown on screen and they were fantastic Mm -hmm. now kelly ain't got shit on judith myers but i also in the interest of science uh googled her (laughs) boobs and they're also super good i put them uh you guys can check them out they're actually in the show notes i saw yeah yeah not bad no they're not but it's a waste it's a total yeah, waste to not show on screen. You're sitting there. You got you got that romantic like firelight. You know, she's she's mm-hmm. sitting over him, mounting him. It's like, yeah, come on, like come on. And then like the bra, I think is even like unclassed. We're like, come on. And I then- know. There was a version of this on AMC that I could have watched for free, but I ended up paying three ninety nine <laughs> to get the iTunes version because I wanted the boobies. five minutes. Yeah. Two dollars a tit. Show the titties. The kids get to see her in her panties mm-hmm. when she's giving out candy. Show us some boobs. Agreed. And I felt wrong because I was kind of turned on by this T-shirt, too. Like, she was only wearing that T-shirt. It's like, cops oh. do it by the book. I was like, oh, hell yeah. All right, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> but, of course, Kelly is killed uh, along with the deputy. And then we have Michael Myers coming up the stairs. And Brady, who is asked, do you know how to operate a gun? He's like, yes. Like, here's a shotgun. Here's some shells. Brady's got the shotgun. He's got the shells. Uh, Jamie and Rachel run up into the attic. Michael Myers is walking up the stairs. He's got like 30 steps to go on the stairs. And he is doing that Michael Myers thing where it's boom, boom, (laughs) boom. All right. The kid has a double barrel shotgun and a shirt pocket full of shells. And he's like fumbling with the shells and the gun. And it's just going on and on. I'm like, this scene is a fucking gift. I'm laughing my ass off. (laughs) And finally... Michael Myers just walks up. He grabs that shotgun out of Brady's hands, and then he does the mic drop. He holds it over the rail, and he's like, "Uh uh-uh. Just (laughs) drops it. I was fucking clapping at this point. Oh, it was fantastic. And there's three parts to this scene. You have Rachel screaming, Brady! Then Brady says, run! Then you hear, boom, Brady! Run! And it goes back and forth three or four times as he closes the distance. Brady deserved to die. Yeah, and clearly nobody in this movie knows how to use guns either because the, the, most of the time they're not shooting Michael Myers. They're shooting locks off of doors. They do it like two or three times. Aside from everybody racking shotguns over and over again, th- these shooting locks off of doors, and this rarely works. Like, guys, just if you're ever in a situation where you're in a locked room and you got a gun, don't shoot the lock. Nine times out of ten, it's not going to work. Maybe if you have a large caliber rifle and you're, you've got some distance or maybe a shotgun, it, it could work. But more often than not, this is what's going to happen if you shoot a lock. You're going to create shrapnel that's going to be flying back at you, if not the ricochet from the bullet. And then you're going to ruin the lock. So it's impossible to open. So the best thing to do is if you're in a room and you can't kick the door down, which should be your first choice, and you can't get through a window and you need to somehow use your gun for some reason, you're not going to, you could use the butt of the weapon if you got like a rifle or shotgun to maybe try to, to smash the lock. But the best thing is probably shoot the hinges of the door or just shoot the fucking door and then kick your leg through it to get through. Uh, Do not shoot the lock. That's Gene's uh, PSA for today. Uh, Also, save bullets. Yeah. (laughs) If Brady hadn't unloaded on the front door, guess what? He's got two shells to shoot Michael on the stairs. Conserve your ammo. Yeah, well, and it's not just about the guns, but like these parents make terrible choices because like I get the idea that they get everybody there to the house and, you know, they get everybody safe. But then like Kelly's by herself making tea in the kitchen and Brady's just kind of walking around with a gun and they leave the two most vulnerable people alone in a room. Like have somebody watch them. Like it makes no sense. If these are my kids and there's some killer dude that's supernatural with a scary mask coming after him, like I'm not letting them out of my sight. It makes no sense. No, I completely disagree. We've we've already discussed that Sheriff Meeks 
He's on board with doing what's necessary. He gets the call in that the hillbilly militia is running around shooting people. So he says, I got to go out and protect people. It makes sense that he would leave. That leaves just the Clint Eastwood looking sheriff or the deputy sitting in the rocking chair. So it makes sense. I mean, granted, I wouldn't have my radio room down in a dark cellar, but you can't put them all in the same room. They think they've done everything to keep themselves safe. I love that you just with a straight face said the deputy sitting in the rocking chair like that was a logical <laughs> choice. Like Michael Myers is here. I've got one entrance to the building that I got to secure. Let's uh, let's sit in the rocking chair. Just chill. Yeah. But I mean, Sheriff Meeks, he locked everything up. He gave him some roofing nails, told him to lock every possible door. He was nailing. They nailed for for God's sake, the the, the closet doors. But he's cool with his daughter walking around, hanging out the bottom of that shirt. Tell her to get some pants on. That's rich coming from you, Big D. Why? Because fucking you, your kid's naked all the time. Mm-hmm. She's a child. You should not look at her that way. If she was well, 18. Well, maybe Sheriff Meeks looks at her as his little girl. If she had a t-shirt on that said, you know what? Digital marketers do it best. Yeah, I'd be like, okay, change your shirt and put on some pants. I don't know. I used to walk around with no pants on when I was this age and those long teen shirts. I mean, I still walk around with no pants on all the time. I, I don't think it's that. I don't know. I, I My dad never. Did you give out candy to the neighborhood kids? Maybe. I don't know. I mean, I wore less <laughs> yeah. than that probably on Halloween. So I think that would have probably been an upgrade when I was a teenager. Just one of those t-shirts. But I don't think. I mean, it's like it's like a night shirt. Yeah. I think it's like a nightgown. Hey, kids, you want a treat? It's disgusting. Ash, would it be cool if a one of your neighbors, a man, did that? Stood there in his underwear with a t-shirt and gave uh, <laughs> gave your kids some candy? Hey, kids, reach into my bucket. I got something special for you. I mean, is he going as a never nude? Because then, yeah, it would be totally No, he's got cool. a t-shirt on that says, you know what? IT support does it right. And he's sitting there with his <laughs> undies. Podcasters do it for free. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, pursued by Michael, Jamie runs down the street and finds Loomis. They take shelter in the school, but Michael appears and subdues Loomis before chasing Jamie through the building. The lynch mob arrives to take Jamie and Rachel to the next town in a pickup truck, but Michael climbs aboard the truck and kills the men. Rachel rams Michael with the truck, and when Jamie approaches Michael and touches his hand, he rises. Meeker, the state police, and the lynch mob shoot Michael until he falls down a mine. Later, Jamie stabs her foster mom, who is running her a bath. Loomis finds an emotionless Jamie at the top of the stairs, holding a pair of bloody scissors. Loomis screams, no, repeatedly, and sinks to the floor, sobbing, as Rachel, Richard, and Meeker stare in horror. Uh, So I just want to question why Loomis has got her in the car. Why not drive away? Go someplace safe. Get her far away. Instead, they take her to the school. And as ridiculous as the scene is, I'm going to admit, as a 45-year-old plus man, I was uneasy. I found myself like conveniently taking notes with my cell phone to block the center portion of the screen because I knew that somehow Michael was going to pop up. It is cheesy. It is campy. It's predictable. But they do enough that even as an adult, I found myself really uneasy watching the scene. You know, you talked about Michael popping up. I think the best jump scare in the movie is when Loomis reappears. Like, she's running down the street and he's like, hey, (laughs) he is bar none the best character in this movie. And they gave him the best jump scare in the movie. Like, by the end of this film, look at Loomis. He's like, he's been nearly blown up at the gas (laughs) station. He's been thrown through a door and he started off like with a cane. He is now a hobbling, shambling bleeding mess but no one in the movie seems to notice like they're all just treating him like he's a respectable medical professional when he looks like a goddamn madman (laughs) (laughs) well i mean and his reaction to the end is so ridiculous but but spot on but i have to say speaking of the end i've never really gotten this reveal. I've always had a bit of a problem with the idea of Jamie becoming the bad guy. I just don't think it makes any sense as to why it would happen. I I know that Michael in the original movie, they talk about how there was some evidence that he was kind of crazy before he goes off and stabs his sister. But Jamie, right. she's just too old for this all of a sudden to like, you know, show up you know did he transfer his psychosis to her when he when she touches him how does that happen has she always been bad is the Mm -mm. blood bad like what are we supposed to get from this because i really hated this ending the first time i saw it and i was hoping i would like it more here and as much as i loved the movie this part i was like okay 
No, it's simple. It was the kids at school. Boogeyman, boogeyman. Your mommy's dead. Your mommy's dead. You got, she's being taken out on Halloween. Her family, the town, her, her foster parents, and the kids have created this. This is bullying. That's what created the killer. <laughs> See, I'm with Ash on this. I, I, I thought it was something with the touch, right? Where like, I was like, wait, was this Michael's mission? Where he's like, listen, I'm old. I'm dying. I've been in a coma for 10 years. I got to pass on this, this bountiful family legacy to, to another youngling. And so he, he just wanted to touch her hand and, and pass it on. I don't know. I felt like that too. But, but you know, Ash, you mentioned it being in the blood. That also makes a lot of sense because that's why she's having these these dreams about Michael and why she chose that outfit in particular. Uh, you know, it's listen, it's Halloween. Live a little. But dude, holy shit. Loomis was actually going to shoot Jamie. He was going to shoot a child. And the sheriff had to come over and be like, no, <laughs> and slow mo and grab the gun. I don't know how I feel about this. I, I kind of understand it, but I really don't. Yeah, Dr. Loomis is to psychology as Dr. Jones is to archaeology. <laughs> like, he doesn't try at any point in this movie to be a doctor in any way. Like, he's no just there. He's like, he's like, listen, let's overreact to everything as much as humanly <laughs> fucking possible. And he could have stayed with the kids and tried to calm them down in the house and, like, tried to be, you know, give them some sort of a... Uh, you know, put them in a safe place mentally while they're going through all this. What does he do? He's like, I got to go get Michael. I'm out of here. Hobble, hobble, hobble. <laughs> but guys, at the beginning of this podcast, I said that Michael was there to, you know, kill Jamie. Then he heard that she was alive and then he wanted to go after his last living relative. I'm not sure if if that's the case. Like part of me wonders if Michael felt responsible for Jamie. So he's in the ambulance. He hears that he's got a living relative and he's like, shit, I got to go like, rescue her you know in some twisted mm -hmm. way right so he escapes he goes to find her in Haddonfield because she's his last living relative like maybe he ne never had an intent to kill her in the first place he just wanted to get her away and yeah he killed a lot of people along the way but he's a killer that's what they do well, maybe he wanted an apprentice do we ever see him try to kill her yes he's trying to grab her a lot but he never once tries to kill her and he had plenty of opportunity He's he's in the room with her alone. He's in the store with her. He could have killed her. I think he wanted an apprentice. I think he just wanted to touch her hand, apparently, to transfer all of his evil to her. And that's what we're supposed to get at the end of the movie. Or maybe he wanted to apologize. Have we yeah. thought of that? Maybe he wanted to apologize. Maybe oh, after God. 10 years in the in the asylum, he thought about what he had done and he wanted to make amends. He was going to sit down and say, I'm sorry about what happened to your mother. I owe you, please don't let this act define you. Rise above it and, and lead a normal life. And I will be here for you. And grab these scissors and <laughs> slaughter your new mommy. I'll be here for you. Every day in secret, he's just journaling, reading books <laughs> yes. on self-improvement and exercising when no one's watching. Yeah, yes. Michael interrupted rather than girl interrupted. <laughs> yeah, he's misunderstood. <laughs> All right. Well, now is the time where we give our wipe scores for Halloween 4, The Return of Michael Myers. Again, uh, Zero Wipes is a perfect movie. Uh, that is going trick-or-treating, getting all the best candy with all your friends in the 80s. No parents needed. No streetlights needed. Jack-o'-lanterns in every window. Five Wipes is a disaster of a movie. The worst movie possible. It's getting pennies or apples or a fucking toothbrush while you're trick-or-treating. Ash, we'll start with you. What is your score for Halloween 4? So I've said throughout that I think that the Halloween movies, they're meant to be ridiculous, but they're also meant to be fun. There's little bits of scares here and there. And this movie does that. It gives you everything that you could wish for except for boobs and maybe a you know a, an ending that makes sense but it's it's good there's parts i laughed at there's parts that were gross there are parts that i went ooh, you know because i was scared and there were little jump scares and michael myers continues to be just a really great bad guy um i will be honest i got bored a couple of times throughout the movie because it was repetitive from the other ones that came before it and i also just don't think they gave us enough backstory with jamie herself um and i'll say this i think the best Halloween franchise movies or those where Michael is paired up with Lori. When Jamie Curtis is there, there's just a different level of movie that exists and acting that exists. And she kind of grounds the whole thing. And that's why I think I like the original in H2O so much. And so this one, I don't think it's quite as good as those movies, which are in the one wipe-ish range. So I'm going to say this is better than average, 
but not quite as good as those. So I give it two wipes. All right. That's two wipes from Ash Laffley. Big D, what's your wipe score for Halloween for the return of Michael Myers? So as much as I've, I've kind of haven't given a glowing review of the film, I did enjoy it. It's fun. It is. It's almost like a normal Halloween movie on fast forward. They do not waste any time. There is no wasted exposition. I mean, Michael is he's a, he, we've seen where he is. In the asylum, he has killed the people. He's escaped. He's back in Haddonfield with his mask, and it felt like it was seven minutes. They get right to it. Everything moves. Uh, the movie knew what it was. It was humorous. It was self-aware. Uh, and in the end, I think it's enjoyable. Is it a perfect movie? No. Is it average? I think it is better than that. I think it is a 1.75 wipe for an 80s, 90s horror film. Is it something that you're going to want to go out and watch again? Maybe every holiday season. Uh, but compared to that genre, I think it's a little better than average. I think you nailed it, Big D, at the 1.75 wipes. This movie absolutely flew by. I mean, it was, you know, we watch a lot of movies uh, for Shat the Movies. And regardless of the length of a movie, the pace of a movie really, really matters. And this one, it, it did fly by. It was a massive improvement, I think, uh, over the previous three Halloween films, including, including the original. But it still honored the sets, the style, and the characters of the original Halloween. There's a scene, the trick-or-treating scene, uh, where they're going down the street. And I remember from Halloween, the 2018 Halloween, that they go down that same street. They shoot it from the same angle. I love that this world feels real to me. It feels like home. Uh, Michael's jazzed up a bit, which makes it a lot more fun. I think he was a lot more fun than he was in the original. And there's plenty of action. There's plenty of humor. Again, I agree with you, Ash, not enough boobs, but Halloween 4 goes up there among my favorite films I'd love to watch on Halloween. If, you know, when the night air is getting chill and the, and the jack-o'-lanterns are out and kids are trick-or-treating, I would love to have this on the screen, having a couple drinks, you know, cozying up uh, by my electric fireplace uh, and just having, having a good time with this movie. So for me, it's one and a half wipes. So that's one and a half wipes for me. Two wipes from Ash and 1.75 wipes from Big D. And Big D's score will be the score for Halloween for the return of Michael Myers with an average wipe score of 1.75 wipes. Uh, so with an average score of 1.75 wipes, that now ties Halloween Part 4, the return of Michael Myers, in the 68 spot with Starship Troopers, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, and War Games. Yeah. I feel good about Starship Troopers and War Games, but planes, trains, and automobiles? I don't know how that happened. Steve Martin's overrated. Oh, mm -hmm. no, it was Roger. Roger gave it a three. That's what happened. It was Roger. As soon as you said Starship Troopers, I went, yup. Like, that totally makes sense. Both yeah, a lot of fits. fun, both campy. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. It works. Works for me. All right. System works. Now is the time in the podcast where we get to our shout outs. Our shout outs are our way of saying thank you for visiting us at shatthemovies.com where you can check out past episodes, look at future episodes, what's coming down the line. Big D was kind enough to put our calendar together through 2021 pretty much. So you can see like almost a year into the future. And there is some exciting shit ending this year and even more exciting shit coming up in 2021. So it's going to be a good year for Shat the Movies. So do check that out at shatthemovies.com. But when you're there, you can fill out the shout out box and we will read your name on the podcast. This week's shout outs go out to Todd from Sydney, Paul Carter, Vanessa, Shani Mac 3TO, Emperor Omardo, former Commerce Floorman 739, Dan Darko, Bob Longarms, and Guy the Swede. Where in the world is Gene Lyons? Right here. Speaking of Carrie Gross, has Ash ever vag packed? Hmm. Have you? No comment. You, wow, that's you have. <laughs> what was it? What'd you vag pack? No comment. Come on, you can't do that. <laughs> I've been to many a music festival, guys. Carrie Gross and I are are ladies of the same kind, I guess. I, maybe it's just a lady thing. I don't know. Anybody who's um, fun. So you shared your glass pipe with the people next to you without telling them where it had been. <laughs> Hey, it's free. You know, you don't have to disclose. It's free. Ooh, this is tangy. <laughs> I don't know what kind you're tasting, Big D. <laughs> All right, Big D, now that the, the ghosts of Halloween have passed, what movie are we doing to kick off November? So excited. 
Uh, so next week we are back to commissions and this movie was commissioned by one of our listeners, Ryan B. And it tells the story of Dante who is called in to cover a shift in his New Jersey convenience store in his day off. His friend Randall helps him pass the time neglecting his video store customers next door to hang out in the quick stop. The uneventful day is disrupted by news that one of Dante's ex-girlfriends has died. After attending her memorial service, Dante muses over staying with current girlfriend Veronica or reuniting with ex Caitlin. It was commissioned again by Ryan B. Came out in 1994, and it is one of Shat the Movie's favorite directors, Kevin Smith. And it made an amazing $3 million at the box office. Wow, let's just... It's going to be a great week next week. I'm excited. I love this movie. I mean, it only costs $200,000 to make, Big D. That's a pretty big profit margin. <sighs> yeah, now he, him and whatever, like 65 years old, wearing the same costumes. It's kind of sad. I don't know. I mean, as the business genius behind Shat, Big D, I, I wouldn't mind this kind of return from you. <laughs> I, I agree. Either. That's right. He's a genius. He's a genius. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Ryan, for your commission. Also, thank you, Tom, for being such a, a great listener. We hope you enjoyed uh, Halloween 4 and uh, and enjoy the rest of your year. Have the spookiest Halloween possible. And uh, thanks for listening again. That concludes this week's episode of Shat the Movies. Be sure to follow us on social media and share with a friend. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram at Shat the Movies. You can email us, host at shatthemovies.com. You can support us by shopping our Amazon affiliate link, completing a free anonymous survey to help attract advertisers, buying our merch, or commissioning your own movie. Find all that information by visiting our website, shatthemovies.com. By the way, big thank you to everybody who's continuing to commission. I can't believe the outpouring of support. Mm -hmm. It's been really, really wonderful. Every time Big D hits us up with another notification of the next movies we're going to do, I I'm so excited to do them. And I can't believe that we have to wait now like eight or nine months to do the movies uh, that we're hearing about now. Uh, but I'm super geeked about what we have in the next year. Also, you can check out our sister podcast, Shout on TV, where we review TV series such as Lovecraft Country, Westworld, True Detective, Taboo, American Gods, Game of Thrones, and Watchmen. Find all that information on our website, shoutontv.com, where everywhere fine podcasts can be found, including iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe, and if you stop by iTunes, please leave a five-star review. That helps the podcast grow. On behalf of my co-hosts, Big D, Dick Ebert, Ash Schlafly, and the King Bee, I'm Gene Lyons. Be sure to join us next week for the following movie. Salsa Shark. We're going to need a bigger boat. Throughout history, they have been a part of our American life. Men and women who have made it their mission to serve their fellow man. They've worked hard enough. Isn't it time? They had their own movie. Clerks. This job would be great if it wasn't for the customers. I, I don't bother them and they don't bother me. I could do without the people in the video store. Do you have that one with that guy who was in that movie that was out last year? You should hear the barrage of stupid questions I get. What do you mean there's no ice? You mean I gotta drink this coffee hot? You'd feel a hell of a lot better if you just rip into the occasional customer. <laughs> You're a clerk paid to do a job. You can't just do anything you want while you're working. convenience store do you run here miramax films presents you think anybody can see us down here why do you want to have sex or something uh, can we clerks just because they serve you doesn't mean they like you you hate people but i love gatherings isn't it ironic featuring new music by soul asylum corrosion of conformity bad religion the jesus lizard and music by alice in chains Thank you.